flower there. They call it sign. Our wedding draws near. Four happy days bring in a new moon. But oh, me thinks how slow this old moon wanes. Hippolyta, I woo thee with my sword and wound thy love doing thee injuries. But I would wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with revelry. Philostrate, stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the curtain's nimble spirit of mirth. <laughs> My child, my daughter, Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath stolen the heart of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her poems and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight sung at her window. Thou hast with cunning filched my daughter's heart. And, my gracious Jew, be it so that she will not, before your grace, consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. <laughs> As she is mine, I may dispose of her. She must obey me and marry with this gentleman, or, according to our law, she must die! What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid. To you, your father should be as a god. He has all the power. You have none. Besides, I know not what your problem here is. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is. But your father demands that you marry the other. I would my father look, but with my eyes. Rather your eyes must see things as your father sees them. Your grace, that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die or to be forever exiled, forever from the society of men, as a nun, a lowly servant to the altar of the goddess Diana. <laughs> I must either die, become a nun. These are your only choices. Then I will die if these are my choices, but I will never consent to marry a man I love not! Take time to heed. And four days from now, the same day I marry my sweet Hippolyta, upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to marry Demetrius. Relay, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy praised title to my certain right. You have a father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermes. Why not marry him? Scorn, Lysander. True, he hath my love. Nor does mine, or my love shall render him. And she is mine, and all my rights on her I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lord. As well he arrived as he is well possessed, my love is more than his. My fortunes every way is fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius's. But more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. 
Why should not then I prosecute my right? Demetrius, I swear it on his head, made love to Nadar's daughter Helena. He won Helena's heart, and she, sweet lady, loves, devoutly loves, and dotes in either tree upon this spotted and fickle man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof. But my mind being overfull of my upcoming marriage, it loses it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. Look, you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up. By no means we may extenuate to death or to avow a single life. Come, Miranda. Hippolyta. What cheer, my love. Demetrius and the Gias, come along. I must confer with you something nearer than concern yourself. With duty and desire, we follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses that do fade so fast? I feel like from want of rain, which I could well beteen them from the tempest of my eyes. The course of true love never did run smooth. A good persuasion. Therefore hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There. Gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then, Steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, by all the vows ever men have broke, in numbers more than ever woman spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly I will meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helen. God speed for Hannah, wither away. Call me fair. Fair again, and say. Demetrius loves your beauty, oh, happy beauty. Your eyes are stars to him, and your voice he adores. If only I had your face, your voice, your charms. Then Demetrius would love me and not you. Oh, teach me how you look and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Was it your friends who teach my smile such skill? I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Was oh, that my prayers could such affection move? The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None. But your beauty. Would that fault were mine? Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. I stand here myself, shall escape this place. Helen, to you our minds you will unfold. Tomorrow night, the darkness comes. To Athens gates are we devised to run away. And in the woods, where often you'd I, upon fair primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms with their counsel sweet. There, my Lysander and myself shall meet, and then through Athens turn away your eyes, to seek new friends and strangers' companies. Farewell, sweet place I love. Pray there for us, and good luck grant thee. By Demetrius. Helena, adieu. As you love him, may Demetrius dote on you. How happy does Hermia seem to be. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she, but what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I err, admiring his quality. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. Therefore is winged Cupid painted blind, nor hath love's mind of any judgment, taste, wings, and no eyes, figure, unheedy haste. 
and therefore is love said to be a child because in choice he is so oft beguiled. Before Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyes, he hailed and loathed that he was only mine. When this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved. Showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood he will tomorrow night pursue her, and I will also go pursuing him. I will betray my friend Hermia, because I have no choice. My love for Demetrius is so strong, it makes me weak. And in the wood, my true love I will seek. Call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is thought fit throughout all Athens, play their issues before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day and night. First, good Mistress Quiz, say what the plagues are, then call forth your actress, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Fair Mrs. Disney. A very good piece of work, I assure you. Now, good Mr. Squint, call forth your actors by your scroll. Master spread yourself. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will last some tears in a true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms, I will condole in some measure. Francis Flute, Bellows Lunder. Your Mr. Squids. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> Nay, fate. Let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. That is all one. You shall play it in a mask and speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisbe, Thisbe. Ah, Pyramus, lover dear. I Thisbe dear, lover dear. No, no, you shall play Pyramus, and Flute, you Thisbe. I'll proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Mr. Squint. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tina Snap, the tinker. Here, Mr. Squint. You, Pyramus's father, myself, Thisbe's father, Snug the joiner, you the lion's part, and here, I hope, is a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion's part too. I will roar and I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar and I will make the Duke say, Let him roar again, let him roar again! And you should do it too terribly that you frighten the Duchess and the ladies that they would shriek, and that would be enough to hang us all. I grant you, friends, that if you should frighten the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voices, I will roar you as gentle as any sucking dove. I will roar you as twere any nightingale. You shall play no part for Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, one that you shall see on a summer's day, most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best play then? Why, what you will. Masters, here are your parts. I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to know them by tomorrow night, and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town, by moonlight. There will we rehearse. We will meet, and we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak we meet. Enough. Hold the cup of drinks.
how now, spirit, whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through bush, through briar, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire. I do wander everywhere swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen to dew her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be, and in their gold coat spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favours, and in their freckles live their savours. I must seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou love of spirits, I'll be gone, for our queen and all her elves come here anon. The king does keep his party here tonight. Take heed, your queen come not within his sight. For Oberon is filled with wrath, because your queen has stolen the child he loves. A lovely boy. Take it from an Indian queen. And jealous Oberon would have the child to run with him and trace the forest wild. But she withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers and makes him all her joy. And now the king and queen do quarrel so. We live in fear to see their anger grow. Either I mistake your shape in making quite, or else you have that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow, are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Those that hobgoblin call you, and sweet puck, you do their work and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speak'st aright, I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile when I a fat and beet fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foe. And sometimes lurk I in a gossip's bowl, and in very likeness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks against her lips, I bob. And on her withered dewlap pour the ale. The wisest aunt telling the saddest tale. Sometimes for a three-foot stool mistaketh me, then slip I from her bum, down topples she. And Taylor cries and falls into a cough, and the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, and wax it in their mirth and knees and swear, a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room fairy, here comes Oberon. Here be my mistress, would that he were gone. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. <laughs> Jealous Oberon, fairies skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Tarry, rash one, am I not thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know whence thou hast stolen away from Fairyland. Have you come to see your sweetheart Hippolyta, wedded to Theseus, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity? How cast thou thus for shame, Titania? Glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus. When Theseus marries Hippolyta, it is you who will feel great hurt. Why must we always be fighting? The answer to our quarrel lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon when all I beg is a little changeling boy to be my page? Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. His mother was a votaress of my order, and it is for her sake that I do rear up her boy. And it is for her sake that I will not part with him. How long within this wood do you intend to stay? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me the boy and I shall go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Now I must away. We shall fight downright if I longer stay. Well then go thy way, thou shalt not move from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest once I sat upon a promontory, and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back, uttering such a dulcet and harmonious breath, that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres, wanting to hear the sea made music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou could not, Cupid with his bow shot his shaft, Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. 
it fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound. Bring me this flower. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids lay will make man or woman fall madly in love with the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, the flower I showed thee once. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eye, so the next thing she waking looks upon, be it on lion or bear or wolf or bull, on meddling monkey or busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And before I release her from this potion's power, I'll make her render up the boy to me. Who comes here? I'm invisible and will overhear their conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? One I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and here am I, unhappy, in this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant. You pull me towards you because I love you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or do I not in plainest truth tell you that I do not, nor cannot, love you? And even for that do I love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. What worser place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You cast too much doubt on your modesty, to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one who loves you not, to trust the opportunities of night and the ill counsel of a desert place will bring shame upon your name. Your virtue is my privilege, for that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you in my respect are all the world. Then how could it be said that I am alone, and all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee, and hide me in the marsh, and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest hath not a heart such as yours. Run if you will, yet I will follow you. I will not. Stay thy questions. Let me go. Or if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. Aye, in the temple, the town, the field, you do me mischief. Bye, Demetrius. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell. To die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Before Demetrius leaves this grove, thou shalt flee from him and he shall seek your love. Welcome, wanderer. Hast thou the flower whose juice produces love? Aye, there it is. I pray thee give it to me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, there sleeps Titania sometime of the night. With the juice of this I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes but do it so that the next thing he sees may be that same lady. You may know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect with some care that he may prove more fond of her than she upon his love. And look thou meet me before the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. O oh, clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders at our quaint spirits, keep yourself away that I may rest. What thou seest when thou doth awake, do it for thy true love's take, love and languish for his sake, be it lynx or cat or bear, leopard or boar with bristled hair, in thine eye it shall appear, when thou wakes it is thy dear, wake when some vile thing is near.
to her love. You faint with wandering the wood. And to speak truth, I have forgot her way. We'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, or find you out of bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and a single troth. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet. It's not like so near. Oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean, that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchanged with an oath, so then, two bosoms in a single troth. Then, by your side, no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much for sure my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But, gentle friend, for love and courtesy, I lie further off in human modesty. Such separation as may well be said, become a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend, thy love ne'er alter to thy sweet life end. Amen, amen, to that fair prayer say I. <sighs> And end life, and I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wished eyes you pressed. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none. On whose eyes might I approve this flower's force and stirring love? Night and silence. Who is here? Garments of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, the spies of the Athenian maid. And hear the maiden sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she dares not lie near the man she loves, this hateful man. <laughs> Upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. And when thou wakes, let love forbid sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Stay, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee, hence, do not haunt me thus. What thou darkling leave me, do not so. Stay. On thy peril, I alone will go. I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy be Hermia, wheresoever she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. Came her eyes so bright, not with salt tears. So my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, I am as ugly as a bear. For beasts that meet me do run away with fear. Therefore no marvel, though, Demetrius, do as a monster fly from my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's fiery eyes. But who's here? My Sander? On the ground? Dead? Or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. And run through fire, will for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows art. Through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia? Lord, what though? Yet Hermia loves you still, be content. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes that I've spent. It's not Hermia, 
but Helen I love. Who would not prefer a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season, so I, being young, till now ripe not to reason. And touching now the point of human skill, reason has become the marshal to my will and leads me to your eyes, which oh look, love stories written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve such scorn? It is not enough, it is not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can, deserve a sweet look from Demetrius's eye. But you must fly to my insufficiency. Good troth, you do me wrong, good sooth you do, in such disdainful manner me to woo. But fare thee well. Perforce I must confess, I thought you a lord of more true gentleness. Without a lady of one man refused, should of another therefore be abused? thou there, and never mayst thou come Lysander near, for as a surefit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings. And all my powers, address your love and might, to honor Helen, and to be her knight! convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage, this Hawthorne break our tiring house, and we will do it in action, as we'll do it before the Duke. Mistress Quince, there are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Tisby that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword and kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How much are you then? That's a perilous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a wit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue and let the prologue seem to say that we will do no harm with our swords and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And, for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus. That will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue and it shall be written in eight and six. Make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will the ladies not be afraid of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters. You ought to consider it yourselves to bring in, God shield us. A lying amongst ladies is a most dreadful thing, for there is no more fearful wild fowl than your lying living. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and saying thus, or to the same effect, Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you, not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, 
then it were a pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. And there indeed, let him name his name, I'll tend them plainly, he is snug to join her. There are two hard things, and that is to bring moonlight into the chamber, for, you know, Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine the night we play our play? A calendar, a calendar! Look in the Yamanix, find out moonshine, find out moonshine! Yes, it doth shine that night. Why then may we leave a casement of the great chamber window open, and there the light may come through the casement? Aye, or else Snow can come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and say that she comes to disfigure or to present the person of Moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber for Pyramus and Thisbe says the story they talk to a chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. Hmm. Some man or other must present wall and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify a wall and let him hold his fingers thus and through the cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so everyone according to his cue. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here? So near the cradle of the fairy queen. What, to play toward? I'll be an auditor. An actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. And speak, Pyramus Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savour sweet. Odors, odors. Odors savour sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe, here. But hark, a voice, say thou wast here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger Pyramus than e'er played here. Must I speak now? Aye, marry must you, for you must understand he goes to see but a noise that he heard and is to come again. <laughs> most radiant Pyramus, most lily wise of you, of colour like the red rose of triumphant briar, most brisky juvenile and eke most lovely Jew, as true truth horse that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninny's tomb, man, why you must not speak that yet, for you answered a Pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter, your cue is past, it is never tire. As true as true as horse, that yet would never tire. That yet would never tire. That yet would never tire. If I were for that, Tisby, I were only thine. Oh, monstrous, oh, strange, we are haunted. Pray, masters, blind masters, help! I'll follow you. I'll lead you about around. Through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound. A hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire. And they and bark and grunt and roar and burn. Like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. This is a knavery of them to make me afeard, to fright me. But no, I will not stir from this place. I will walk up and down here and make a great noise, that they shall see I am not afeard. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? I pray thee, gentle mortal, speak again. Mine ear is much enamoured of thy voice, so is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. Thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me, on first view to say, to swear, I love thee. He thinks, mistress, he should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity honest neighbours will not make friends. Nay, I can jest upon occasion. Thou art wise as thou art beautiful. Not so neither, but if I had wit enough to exit this wood, I would have enough wits to serve mine own truth. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state. 
and I do love thee. Therefore go with me, and I will give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so, that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom. Ready. Cobweb. And I. Mustard seed. And I. Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs and mulberries. And pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal. Hail. Hail. <laughs> Tie up my lover's tongue, and bring him silently. I wonder if Titania be awake, and what it was that next came in her eyes, she must dote on in extremity. Here comes a messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love. Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals who work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's no life fixed upon his head, and on his thisby must be answered. So forth my mimic comes when they him spy, so at his sight away his fellows fly. And at our stamp here, o'er and o'er one falls, he murder cries and help from Athens calls. Their sense, thus weak, lost with their fears, thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong. For briars and thorns at their apparel snatched, some sleeves, some hats from yielders, all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. When in this moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked, and straightway loved an ass. This falls out better than I could devise. But tell me, Hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juice that I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, thought us finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked of force she must be eyed. Stand close, this is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. Demetrius? Hermia! Oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay bread so bitter on a bitter foe. Now I but chide that I should use thee worse, for thou I fear hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being o'er shoes and blood, plunge in the deep and kill me too. But it cannot be, for thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look so dead, so grim? So should the murdered look, so should I, pierced to the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear, as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I'd rather give his carcass to my hounds. Oh dog, oh cur, thou drives me past the bed of mate and patience. Hast thou slain him then? Hast thou killed him sleeping? A brave judge, could not a worm and ought to do so much. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee then, tell me that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no! Oh. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. What hast thou done? 
Thou hast mistaken quite, and lain the love juice on some true love's sight. About this wood go swifter than the wind, and Helen of Athens look thou find. Oh, fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer, with sights of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion, see thou bring her here, and I'll charm his eyes against he do appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than the arrow of a tartar's bow. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink in the apple of his eye, when his love he do espy. Make her shine as gloriously as a Venus of the sky, when thou wakes if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand. And the youth mistook by me, pleading for a lover's fee. Shall we their fond pageant see? Lord, what fools these mortals be! Stand aside. The noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. Then will two at once woo one. That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best please me that befall preposterously. Why should you think I woo in scorn? Scorn and derision never comes in tears. If you do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, the devilish home fray. These vows are Hermes. Will you give her o'er? Weigh oath with oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her and me put in two scales will even weigh, and both as light as tails. I had no judgment when I swore. Nor none in my mind, now you give her o'er. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. Oh, Helena, goddess, nymph, perfect, divine. To what, my love, shall I compare thy nine? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripe and show thy lips, those kissing cherries, tempting grow. Bite! Oh, hell! I see you are all bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me, as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too? If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so. To vow and swear and super praise my parts when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia. They're both rivals to mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience. Also make you sport. You're unkind, Demetrius. Be not so. For you love Hermia, this you know I know. Here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield you up my part, and yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Ah, Lysander, keep thy Hermia, I will none. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her but is guestwise sojourned, and now to Helen is at home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know. Lest thy peril, thou abide it, dear. Look where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. Mine ear, I thank it, brought me to thy sound. But why, unkindly, didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay, whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love thou would not let him bide. Fair Helena, who more in guilds tonight, than all you fiery orbs and eyes of light. Why seekest thou me? Cannot this make thee know the hate I bear that made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think. It cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful me. Have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? All the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' hours, the vows we have spent, and will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, it is not maidenly. Her sex as well as I may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not, it seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face? 
made your other love Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph divine and rare, precious celestial. Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul, and tender me, forsooth, affection? But by your setting on, by your consent! I understand not what you mean by this! If you had any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. Fare thee well. It is partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Stay, gentle Helena. Hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Excellent. Sweet, she must scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreat. Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helena, I love thee. By my life I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee. To prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it to you. Quick, come. Lysander, where to all this tends? Away, you Ethiope! No, no, he'll but seem to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You're a tame man, go. Hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing. Let loose or shake thee from me like a serpent. Why are you grown so rude? What change is this? Sweet love! Thy love, out, Tani Tata, out. Out, loathe medicine, hated potion, hence. Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I'll keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What greater harm can you do me than hate? Hate me? Wherefore, oh me? What news, my love? Am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why? Then you left me, oh the gods forbid! In earnest shall I say! I, by my life, I never did desire to see thee more. Therefore, be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh me, you juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love! What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine in faith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you puppet! Why so? I, that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her terse personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth she hath prevailed with him. Now are you grown too high in his esteem, because I am so dwarfish and low? How low am I, thou painted maple? Speak! How low am I? I'm not yet so low, but that my nails can reach unto thy- Pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You may perhaps think because she's something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower! Hark again! Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia, did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you, save that in love unto Demetrius, I told him of your stealth into this wood. He followed you for love, I followed him. But he hath chid me hence and threatened me to spurn me, strike me, nay, to kill me too. And now so you will let me quiet go. To Athens will I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go, you see how simple and how fond I am. Why, get you gone. Who is it that hinders you? foolish heart that I leave here behind. What? With Lysander? With Demetrius? Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. Oh, when she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school. And though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again! Nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her! Get you gone, you dwarf. You minimus of hindering not grass maid! You bead! You acorn! You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena. Take not her part. For if thou dost intend to never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try who's right, in thine or mine, is most in Helena. Follow. Nay, I'll go with thee. Cheek. By Jowl.
You, mistress, all this turmoil is because of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you. I no longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands and mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. I'm amazed to know not what to say. This is my negligence. Still thou mistakest, or else committest these knaveries willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I am a stuck. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments be had on? And so far blameless proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so far am I glad it so did sort, as this their jangling I esteem a sport. Crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose juice hath this virtuous property. And take from thence all air with his might, and make his eyes roll with wanted sight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision. And back to Athens the lover shall wend, with league whose date till death shall never end. And I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy. And I will her charmed eye release, her monster's view, and all shall be peace. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town, goblin lead them up and down. Here comes one. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to plainer ground. Lysander, speak again. Thou run away, thou coward. Art thou fled? Speak. In some bush, where dost thy hide thy head? Thou coward, out thou bragging to the stars, telling the bushes that thou lookst for wars and wilt not come. Come, recreant, come, thou child. I'll whip thee with a rod. He is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Come, thou gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy grey light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. Nay, then thou mockest me. Thou shalt buy this dear, if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure my length on this cold bed. By day's approach, look to be visited. Weary night, a long and tedious night. Faith thy hour, shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight from those that my poor company detest. And sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye, steal me away from mine own company. Yet but three, come one more. Two of both kinds make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a naved lad, thus to make poor females mad. Never so weary, never so in woe, but dabbled with dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. 
My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me to the break of day. Heavens shield Lysander if they mean afraid. On the ground sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye gentle lover remedy. And when thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known that every man shall take his own in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill, the man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk rolls in thy sleek smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. Wilt thou hear some music, sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear for music. Let us have the tongues and the bones. Music! Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies be gone, and all ways away. So doth the woodbine the sweet honeysuckle gently entwist, the female ivy and rings the backy fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. Well, Bob, seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood. Seeking sweet favours for this, this hateful fool. I did upbraid her, and fall out with her. For she his hairy temples, that had around it, with a coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers. I did at my pleasure taunt her, and she in mild terms begged my patience. I asked of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me and her fairy sent to bring him to my bower in fairyland. Now that I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he may wake when the other do, and all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first I will release the fairy queen, be as thou wast want to be, see as thou wast want to see. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions I have seen. Methought I was enamoured of an ass. Here lies your love. Oh, how came these things to pass? 
Mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Now when thou wakest with thine own fool's eyes, Pete, Fairy King, attended Mark, I do smell the morning lark. Come, my queen, in silence sad, trip we after the night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight tell me how it came this night, that I sleeping here was found with this mortal on the ground. Strange, my dear Hippolyta, what these lovers speak of. But all the stories of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, were witness some fancy's images, and grow to something of great constancy. But howsoever, strange and admirable. Indeed, we both have witnessed the power of transfiguration given by our forest friends upon us and our kin these last few hours. Here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to the anguish of a torturing hour? Call Philistrate. Philistrate! Say, what entertainment have you for this evening? What mask? What music? How should we beguile the lazy time if not with some delight? There is a brief how many sports are ripe. Make choice of which your ladyship will see first. The battle with the centaurs, to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. We'll have none of that. The trice tree muses mourning for the death of learning, late deceased in beggary. That is some satire, keen and critical. Not the sort for a nuptial ceremony. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical, tedious and brief. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed labourers that work in Athens here, which have never laboured in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with the same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it. No, my noble one, it is not for you. I have heard it over. It is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents. Extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss, when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, lords and ladies. So please, my lady, the prologue is addressed. Let them approach. We offended is with our goodwill, that you should think we come not to offend but with goodwill, 
To show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end, consider then we come but in despite. We do not come as minded to contest you. All for your delight we are not here that you should here repent you. The actors are at hand, and by their show you should know all that you are like to know. This player doth not stand upon points. She hath rid her prologue like a rough colt. She knows not the stop. A good moral, my lady. It is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, they had played on their prologue like a child and a recorder. Ascend, but not in government. Their speech was like a tangled chain. Nothing impaired, but all disordered. <laughs> Who is next? I wonder if the lion be to speak. No wonder, my lady. One lion may, when many asses do. <laughs> <laughs> In this same interlude doth befall, that I would starve a link, present a wall. And such a wall that I would have you think, that had in it a crannied hole or chink. To which the lover's pyramid and tis be, did whisper often very, very secretly. This lone, this rough cast, and this stone doth show, that I am that same wall, the truth is so. And this, the cranny, is right and sinister, to which the fearful lovers are to whisper. Hermes draws near the wall. Silence! O oh, Grimlock Knight, O oh, Knight with hue so black, O oh, Knight whichever art when day is not, O oh, Knight, O oh, Knight, alack, alack, alack. I fear my Thisbe's promises forgot, and thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet hollow we wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine, thou wall, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet hollow we wall, show me thy chink to blink through it mine eye. Thanks, courteous wall, Jove shields thee well for this. But what see I? No Thisbe do I see. O wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss, cursed be thy sons for thus deceiving me. The wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. No, in truth, madame, he should not. Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now, and I am to spy her through the wall. Yonder she comes. O wall, full often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fairy Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones. <laughs> thy stones with lime and hair lift up in thee. I see a voice, now will I to the chink, To spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe! My love thou art, my love I think. <laughs> think what thou wilt, I am thy lover's grace, And like Lamander, am I trusty still? And I like Helen, till fate me kill. Not Shaphilus to Procris was so true. Shaphilus to Procris, I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the walls hole, not your lips at all. <laughs> Wilt thou at Ninny's too meet me straight away? Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. Thus why wall, my part is shattered so, and being done, thus wall away doth go. Now is a mural down between the two neighbours. No remedy, my lady, when walls are so willful to hear without warning. This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. The best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse, if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination then, and not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Look, here come two noble beasts in, a man and a lion. <coughs> you ladies, whose gentle hearts do fear, the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor May now perchance both quake and tremble here When land rough in while this rage doth roar Then know that I, once snook to join around A lion's fell nor as no lion's dam If I should as lion come in strife Into this place, twere pity on my life this lantern doth the horned moon present. He should have worn the horn on his head. <clears throat> this lantern doth the horned moon present. Myself, the man on the moon, do seem to be. This is the greatest error of all the rest. This player should be put into the lantern. How is it else the man in the moon? He dares not come there for the candle, for you see, it is already in snuff. I'm a weary of this moon. Would he would change? Proceed, moon. All that I have to say is to tell you that this lantern is the moon. I, the man in the moon. This thornbush, my thornbush. This dog, my dog. 
This is all Denise Doom. Where is my love? <laughs> well roared, Lion. Well run, Thisbe. Well shone, Moon. Truly the moon shines with a good grace. Well moused, Lion. And so the Lion vanished. And then came Pyramus. Sweet Moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, Moon, for shining now so bright. For by thy gracious golden glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest Thisbe sight. But stay, O oh spite, but mark, poor knight, what dreadful sorrow is here. Eyes do you see, how can it be, O oh dainty duck, O oh dear? Thy mantle good, what stained with blood? Approach ye furies fell. O oh fates, come, come, cut threatened from, quell, crush, conclude, and quail. This passion and the death of a dear friend will go near to make a man look sad. Oh, my heart, but I pity the man. O oh, if for nature didst thou lion's frame, since lion vile hath here the flowered my dear, which is no no, which was the fairest dame that lived, that light, that loved, with cheer. Come tears confound out sword out wound, the pap of Pyramus, I that let pap where hearts doth hop. Thus die I, thus, thus, thus. Now am I dead, now am I fled. My soul is in the sky, tongue loose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. Now die! Die, 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 die. With the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover and prove an ass. How chance Moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover? She will find him by starlight. Look, here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Methinks she should not use a long one for such a pyramus. I hope she'll be brief. She hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. Asleep, my love, what well, dead, my dove, O oh, Pyramus, arise. Speak, speak, quite dumb, dead, dead, a tomb was covered thy sweet eyes. These lily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow casket cheeks are gone, are gone, lovers make moan, his eyes were green as leeks. O oh, sister three, come, come to me with hands as pale as milk. Lay them in gore, since you have shore which shears his thread of silk. Tongue not a word. Come, trusty sword, come, stain my breast with blood. And thus farewell, friends, thus this be end. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Moonshine and Lion are left to bury the dead. Aye, and Wall too. Will it please you to see the epilogue, or to hear a dance between two of our company? No! no! No, no epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Never excuse, for when all the players are dead, there needs none to be blamed. Marry, if he that writ had played Pyramus and hanged himself from Thisbe's garter, it would have been a fine tragedy. And so it is, truly, and very no be discharged. But let your epilogue alone, the iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve. Lovers, to bed, tis witching time, I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn. As much as we this night have overwatched this powerful gross play have well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed, a fortnight hold we this solemnity, in nightly revels and new jollity.
If we shadows have offended, Think but this and all is mended, That you have but slumbered here While these visions did appear, And this weak and idle theme No more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend, If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, If we have unearned luck, Now to escape the serpent's tongue, We will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call. So good night, and to you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, And Robin shall restore amends. <laughs>